One of the challenges of addressing the food security issue is how varied the farm systems are around the world. This isn't surprising. The world itself is incredibly varied in what's grown, where, how, climate, soils, topography, uh, biodiversity, all have an enormous effect in shaping farm systems. And because of that, there is certainly no single answer uh, to how farms can become more productive, for example, or how uh, local populations uh, can become healthier in what they eat. Different places grow different foods. They eat different foods. Uh, they face uh, different climatic uh, and agronomic challenges. And part of our proper uh, problem solving, uh, our diagnostics uh, and our solutions for the issues of a sustainable food supply depend on us understanding in detail how these farm systems differ around the world. Well, to do that, let's take a look at the world in the big picture to get a, a very macro sense of uh, how farm systems uh, are shaped and uh, how they differ in different places in the world. Consider uh, the land area of Earth in its entirety. There are about 130 million square kilometers of land on Earth. And of that, a remarkably large proportion uh, are already taken by humanity for uh, human needs. Agriculture, uh, meaning both farmland, arable land used to grow crops, and meadows and pasture lands, grasslands, used to feed animals, uh, constitute together around 50 million uh, square kilometers, or roughly 40%, a little under 40% of the world's total land area. This by itself is rather astounding. One species of the millions on the planet uh, has requisitioned land for us to feed us. And when we discuss the declines of biodiversity, the first thing to keep in mind is how much of the output of food on the planet, how much of the photosynthesis on the planet is taken for human need and how much that leaves the rest of the biosphere uh, behind and threatened by uh, this uh, human uh, uh, grab for the planet's uh, uh, primary uh, production of, uh, of uh, food. So 50 million square kilometers uh, used for uh, arable and pasture land. Roughly uh, of that, uh, 14 million for arable, that's for croplands, uh, and roughly 34 million square kilometers for meadows and pasture lands. So the farmland itself accounts for a little over 10% of the world's land area. Pastures, much bigger, around a, a quarter uh, of the total land area on the planet uh, in grassland regions used to graze animals. Another 39 million or so square kilometers is for forests. Many of those forests are managed forests, plantations uh, for pulp and paper, for example, for timber, uh, for logging. Uh, some of those forests uh, are not managed, the boreal, vast boreal forests uh, in the high latitudes uh, uh, as an example. The forests in total account for another 30% or so of the Earth's land area. The remainder is another roughly 30%. Uh, it's another uh, 41 million square kilometers. A lot of that is desert. A lot of that is uninhabitable. A few percent of the uh, world's land areas in our cities where half the world's population live, but we're so densely settled in the cities that the cities uh, themselves, the urban extent, only accounts for a few percent uh, of the 130 million square kilometers. Most uh, remains 
either in the form of agricultural land, forest land, uh, or uh, deserts uh, and uh, uninhabitable land areas. You're looking at a map now of uh, where the agricultural land is, both the cropland and the grazing land. And the colors here are showing you places where the cropland is very concentrated. Not every place where uh, land is used to grow crops, but places where a very high proportion of the land in that area is actually arable uh, or cropland. That's the green shaded areas. It's the Midwest of the United States. It's parts of Western, uh, Central, and Eastern Europe. It's much of uh, China and India. Uh, in Africa and in, uh, in uh, South America, uh, you see land that is mixed in grazing land and in cropland. Uh, the drier areas tend to be places where food crops uh, can't be grown uh, with high productivity. If the rains uh, fall below a certain uh, amount uh, during the rainy season, then uh, crops can't grow at all. And to the extent that people live in those environments that they're not desert, but rather are uh, arid, but not uh, extreme hyper-arid regions, they are places that are used for grazing animals. So livestock production tends to be in the drier areas. Nomadic populations who are pastoralists full-time for their livelihoods, often with no crops at all, are living in places just on the margins of the desert. In Africa, you see uh, these... Uh, uh, grazing land areas just south of the Sahara Desert in the top half of the African continent, and then around the Kalahari Desert in the southern uh, part. The forests are shown in the next graph, and there are two major forest areas to keep in mind. First is the forest areas around the equatorial belt. These are the rainforests. The Earth's climate is, of course, uh, providing most uh, solar radiation at the equator. It's the warmest at the equator. The land uh, uh, is heated. Air masses rise and provide uh, continuous rainfall, uh, or heavy rainfall, I should say, in the equatorial regions of the world. And that provides the climatic base for the three great rainforests of the world, the Amazon, in South America, the Congo Basin in Africa, and the great rainforests of the Indonesian archipelago in Southeast Asia. That's the band around the equator. Then you see the other major forest region, which is in the high latitudes, the boreal forest, for example, uh, in, across the uh, vast Eurasian landmass and, and, and across uh, Canada. Many of these forests are being threatened especially today, the rainforests, because these are all areas where populations are encroaching for a variety of reasons, either to clear the rainforest to make way for uh, pasture land and for cropland, or uh, poor people uh, encroaching on the forest for fuel wood and for other uh, goods and services that they can procure from the forest, but sometimes in such great numbers that they are deforesting in an unsustainable way. This pattern of where the cropland is and uh, where the forests are, you can see is very deeply rooted in the ecological conditions, the climate, including temperatures, rainfall, the topography, the shape of the land, whether it's steeply sloped and not possible to farm or whether it's a uh, flat land in plains, uh, much easier, more productive to farm, whether irrigation is feasible because there is groundwater or rivers nearby that can be used for irrigation, uh, whether the soils are adequate uh, and the range of soil types depending on the, uh, the uh, underlying uh, 
uh, geologic conditions also shape the farm systems. It's worthwhile for us to take one uh, deeper look in one part of the world to see uh, the geography shaping the farm systems, shaping the society, uh, in effect, uh, in these agricultural regions. And, and that's in Africa, where we can see very, very clearly how the uh, distinctive characteristics of climate uh, cause very distinctive farm systems and very distinctive economic results as well. This is a map, quite a beautiful map, I think, of uh, uh, the various farm systems uh, in Africa, 14 major agroecological zones, each one a specific kind of farm system. Uh, perhaps it's a good idea to decipher this map in, in stages, starting at the equator uh, in the large green area right uh, at, at the center of the African continent. That's the Congo Basin. That's the great Congo rainforest. And rainforests are very particular uh, when it comes to agriculture. Very difficult uh, to farm often. Uh, soil uh, nutrients uh, are bombarded by heavy rainfall. If trees are cleared, uh, as is sometimes done to try to make farms, uh, it often is the case that the soil nutrients, which were up uh, in uh, the trees themselves rather than in the soil, are quickly uh, depleted. Uh, and uh, it turns out that the land is uh, not suitable for intensive farming uh, and uh, not even suitable for pastoralism or um, for livestock management. If you, we move from the equator, we come to uh, different farm systems graded to a very important extent according to how much water uh, is uh, actually available through rainfall uh, and uh, other, uh, other resources. Take a look at West Africa, for example, just above the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and right along the coast, the entire uh, coast uh, of West Africa, is a still wet, though not rainforest, region, uh, which is ideal for tree crops, uh, for the cocoa plantations of Ghana, uh, the rubber plantations uh, of Ghana, Benin, Togo, uh, and uh, Liberia. Uh, so this is a climate uh, not of uh, annual uh, grain crops, but of tree crops because of its humidity, uh, and its ideal circumstances for tree crops. Move north of that, away from the equator, uh, you move into an environment where there is a rainy season, but the farther north you go into the uh, northern hemisphere, the drier uh, is, are the conditions and the shorter is the rainy season. So just north of the rubber and cocoa plantations, uh, one finds uh, what is called the root crop systems, for example, where cassava is grown uh, and uh, other uh, tubers uh, and root crops are grown in this relatively wet environment, but not wet enough to support cocoa uh, trees or rubber trees. Move just north of that, and then you're into a grain belt. Uh, for example, where maize, or in the United States we call it corn, uh, is grown. This is now a part of Africa where uh, instead of the year-round rainfall of the equator, you have one rainy season, uh, which uh, may give a growing season of 150 days for one crop of maize per year. It can be rather productive if the topography and if the soils are right and if the rains are good. It can be a disaster if it's a year of bad rainfall, and there is relatively high variability in these places, and in the African context, at least, relatively low use of irrigation, so a dependency on uh, the variation of the rains. Now, as you continue the march 
north from the equator towards the North Pole, the rainy season gets shorter and shorter. So after the band of grain growing region uh, is another farm system. Uh, and this is a farm system that mixes crops with livestock. The livestock to graze on the grasses, the crops to capture a short growing season. But now it has to be crops that are pretty resilient to uh, short rains and even to drought. Those are sorghum and millet, for example. So we have passed through the maize region into the sorghum and millet region combined with more livestock. And this is the uh, so-called uh, agro-pastoralist zone because it's both agriculture and pastoralism. Move a bit north of that uh, and you move into a range uh, that is an all-pastoralist region. And these are places often of nomadic populations, such as the Tuareg uh, in northern Mali. The population densities are very low. The populations are nomadic because they have to follow the rains. And as the rains move throughout the season, the grasses spring up for short periods of time in these dry environments, and the animals better be where the grasses are so the animals move around. Also, the nomads move across national boundaries. No one told the animals and no one told the rain, this is Mali, this is Chad, this is Niger, stay in your place. And these artificial boundaries that have been put first by the imperial powers and now as part of our political world have wreaked havoc on the pastoralist traditions that find themselves cut off from their family, neighbors, and their grasslands across a political boundary that has no ecological sense. Now consider one step north of the pastoralist lands and you're in the Saharan desert. We have, or I should say Sahara because it's the desert. Uh, so uh, in, in, uh, uh, in fact, you've entered the desert uh, and we have seen the graded transition by latitude band from a rainforest to a tree crop region to a uh, root and tuber crop region to a grain region to a agro-pastoralist region to a pastoralist region and then to the desert. It's not surprising this is complicated. It's complicated for countries to manage this diversity it's complicated when populations like pastoralists need to move across boundaries. It's complicated to get international agreements on what to do about issues of climate or energy or food production when we see these strong variations of farm systems uh, across the regions. It's very hard often for people to speak with each other and to understand the problems and the stresses that are unfolding. This is one of the reasons why the world has failed to comprehend challenges like uh, the crises of the Horn of Africa and the ongoing crises of the Sahel. These are agro-pastoralist regions or in some cases pastoralist regions only. Very poor, uh, very much dependent on rainfall, suffering the burdens of climate change, instability of rainfall, rising populations, falling trend in total precipitation, increasing hunger, and as a result, increasing instability and violence. We need to understand these farm systems, where they are, how they vary around the world, if we are to achieve sustainable uh, agricultural yields that can feed and keep populations healthy in the future.